subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss any video lesson from Rao's IA Study Circle. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from your UPSC perspective. Now today we shall discuss the important news which has appeared in the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 22nd August 2020. The news to be discussed has been displayed on your screen and timestamp for the same has been provided in your description box below. So on this note let's start today's discussion from our examination perspective. Now the first news to be discussed appears as a lead article on page number 6. It says differential impact of COVID-19 and the lockdown. The resultant distress in India has exacerbated pre-existing structures of disadvantage based on social identity. So this article discusses the idea that whether impact of COVID-19 has been cast neutral or not. That is whether the economic as well as social impact of COVID-19 is class neutral or it has impacted such people from a particular segment of the society including a particular caste either higher caste or lower caste. So in this article we will go through the important aspects highlighted by the authors with respect to this caste neutrality caused due to the pandemic of COVID-19. Now this topic becomes very important from the perspective of GS paper 1, GS paper 2 as well as GS paper 3. In our GS paper 1 it gets covered under salient features of Indian society. In GS paper 2 it gets covered under role of NGOs, welfare schemes for the vulnerable sections of the population as well as issues relating to social sector services such as health, education as well as human resources. Whereas in GS paper 3 it gets covered under issues relating to Indian economy including inclusive growth. Now this article starts by mentioning about a book named The Great Leveller and it has been written by Walter Schiedel who is an Austrian economic historian. Now the author says that throughout human history there have been four catastrophic events which have led to greater economic equality. So according to the author four catastrophic events of the world have led to greater economic equality. These events are pandemic, war, revolution as well as state collapse as it affects all segments of the society equally according to this author. However, the authors of the present lead article have a very different view especially with respect to COVID-19. They say that COVID-19 cannot be said to be class neutral as it has affected the lower societies or the lower caste more as compared to the upper caste and accordingly various reasons have been provided with respect to this particular aspect highlighted in the article. So the authors have said that based on certain data and statistics across the world including India, COVID pandemic has impacted the lower sections of the society more as compared to the higher section. So in this regard the authors have said that socially and marginalized groups as well as the oppressed class are at greater risk especially in India. And accordingly this aspect of differential impact of COVID-19 especially pertaining to socio-economic aspect has been dealt with respect to job loss, education level as well as access to technology based on how COVID-19 has impacted different caste of India. So with respect to the job loss caused due to COVID-19 the authors in this article has provided for certain data and statistics compiled by the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy as it had conducted the Consumer Pyramids Household Survey and this survey had collected a set of database on unemployment caused during the lockdown period. So in this aspect the authors have analyzed the data based on caste and other vulnerable groups of India. So in this regard let us go through the Consumer Pyramid Household Survey conducted by Center for Monitoring Indian Economy. So it is in this regard that this article has presented this statistic especially with respect to drop in employment as well as the fall with respect to percentage points. Now here the authors have highlighted about upper caste, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, other backward class as well as intermediate castes. Now with respect to upper caste the drop in employment from December 2019 to April 2020 was recorded from 39% to 32%. So we can say that for upper caste the percentage fall was 7%. Whereas with respect to scheduled caste the proportion of employed scheduled caste dropped from 44% to 24% from the period December 2019 to April 2020 and accordingly the fall in percentage points with respect to employment was 20% for scheduled caste. Further with respect to scheduled tribes the drop in employment was from 48% to 33% thereby denoting a drop of 15 percentage points. 
whereas for obcs the drop in employment percentage was from 40% to 26% that is a drop of 14 percentage points and for intermediate caste the authors mentions that the drop has been at 8 percentage point from 42 to 34% so overall what the authors have tried to highlight is that it is the lower caste including the scheduled caste scheduled tribe other backward class and intermediate caste who have suffered greater as compared to those people belonging into the upper caste further in this regard the author have also taken data from indian human development survey for 2011 12 and this data is with respect to percentage of households having illiterate adult female as well as percentage of households having illiterate adult male with respect to scheduled caste 51 percent of women have zero education whereas this percentage for upper caste is 24 percent so again we see a huge difference with respect to education level between the upper caste and scheduled caste further as for the survey there are 27 percent illiterate adult male with respect to scheduled caste and 11 percent illiterate adult male with respect to upper caste so again we see the disparity with respect to education now in this regard the author have suggested that job losses associated with covid 19 are much more concentrated among individuals with low level of education and in india we see that low level of education is mostly with respect to the lower caste so accordingly the author says that losses associated with covid 19 are much more concentrated among individuals with low levels of education and those with vulnerable jobs with no tenure or security so in this regard the author suggests that people with more than 12 years of education were much less likely to be unemployed in April 2020 than those who had less than 12 years of education. So the authors have highlighted that education level of individuals was an important criteria for job loss and especially such people who had low levels of education were more vulnerable to job loss due to COVID pandemic. So overall the author says that education did turn out to be a protective factor in the first wave of immediate post lockdown job losses. Further, with respect to use of technology or access to technology, the author says that lower caste families are more deprived when it comes to internet facility for various inclusive activities such as online education for the children, internet banking facility, etc. And according to the authors, differential access to information technology as well as disparities in the ability to invest in technology because of their lower income will be critical in shaping access to online education. So overall again the author says that those people with lower income are mostly from lower caste and accordingly these people are facing difficulties with respect to access to technology. So the author says that if the pandemic forces schools to close for a substantial period of time then children of people belonging to lower caste will have more problems as compared to children of people belonging to upper caste. And this is also because the parents of upper caste are more educated as compared to parents of lower caste. So again we see that the impact of education level of parents also falls on the child especially during COVID-19 because of closure of schools. So this article has concluded by saying that the pandemic induced lockdown has increased economic distress more for the people belonging to lower caste and strata of our society. So in this regard, the government must fill the gap by increasing access of education for lower strata of the society, including the lower caste as well as those people from the vulnerable sections. The government must increase banking access for such people, which will further help into financial inclusion and also provide health access, especially during the present pandemic of COVID-19. So in this regard, the author suggests that investments in education and health that close gaps between social groups would be essential to build resilience in the face of future shocks. So it is in this aspect this article becomes important from the perspective of GS paper 1, GS paper 2 as well as GS paper 3. With this let's move on to our next news of discussion. The next news to be discussed appears on page number 1. It says ahead of Bihar poll election commission not for filing nominations online. Guidelines for elections restrict attendees at public rallies. So these are some of the important guidelines with respect to election commission for the upcoming Bihar elections as well as by elections. So in this regard as for the guidelines the election commission of India has revised the norms of number of persons who will accompany the candidate and also number of vehicles at the time of nomination. 
Further, it says that it has created an optional facility to fill the nomination form and the affidavit online and submission of the same after taking print out before the returning officer concerned. So in this regard, you must know about returning officer and also their functions. Now the provision of returning officer has been provided under section 21 of representation of people act of 1951. It says that for every constituency, for every election to fill a seat or seats in council of states and for every election by members of legislative assembly of a state to fill a seat or seats in the legislative council of the state, the election commission shall in consultation with the government of the state designate or nominate a returning officer who shall be an officer of the government or of a local authority. Further, the election commission can also designate the same person as returning officer for more than one constituency. So these aspects becomes important from our examination perspective, especially from our prelims as the provision of returning officer has been provided under section 21 of representation of people act of 1951. Moving further with the guidelines, it says that for the first time, the candidates will have the option to deposit security amount for contesting the elections online. So the security amount can be deposited online. Further, the guideline says that keeping the containment guidelines in view, the election commission has limited the number of persons, including candidate for door to door campaign to five. So only five persons can go for door to door campaign. Now, with respect to public meeting and road shows, it says that these will be permissible with suitable instructions subject to containment instructions issued by Ministry of Home Affairs as well as respective state government. Now, during the electoral process, face mask, sanitizer, thermal scanners, gloves, face shield as well as PPE kits shall be used, including ensuring social distancing norms. The guidelines further say that the hand gloves shall be provided to all the electors for signing on the voter register and pressing the button of EVM for voting. So the buttons of EVM shall not be pressed with bare hands but with gloves on the hand. Further it says that the chief electoral officers of the concerned states or union territories shall make comprehensive state or district wise election plans regarding arrangements and preventive measures following these guidelines. And while making the guidelines, the chief electoral officer should also take local conditions into account. Further, it says that these plans shall be prepared in consultation with nodal officer for COVID-19 in their respective states as well as union territories. So these can be said to be the highlights with respect to important guidelines issued by Election Commission of India with respect to upcoming Bihar Assembly elections. Now here another term mentioned was chief electoral officer. And the provision for chief electoral officer has been provided under representation of people act of 1950. So with respect to chief electoral officers, the provision says there shall be for each state, a chief electoral officer who shall be such officer of the government as the election commission may in consultation with that government designate or nominate in this behalf. Further, it says that subject to superintendence, direction and control of the election commission, Chief Electoral Officer shall supervise the preparation, revision and correction of all electoral rules in the state under this act. So the designation or nomination of Chief Electoral Officer has been provided under Section 13A of Representation of People Act of 1950. Now Representation of People Act of 1951 provide for observers. So here the election commission may nominate an observer who shall be an officer of the government to watch the conduct of election or elections in a constituency or a group of constituencies and also to perform such other functions as may be entrusted to him by the election commission. Now another important aspect here is that that the observers have power to stop counting of votes. It highlights that the observer shall have the power to direct the returning officer for the constituency or for any of the constituencies for which he has been nominated that is any of the constituencies which falls under his jurisdiction to stop the counting of votes at any time before the declaration of result or not to declare the result at all if in the opinion of the observer booth capturing has taken place at a large number of polling stations or at such fixed places for counting of votes. So the observers who are appointed under representation of People Act of 1951 also have the power to stop counting of votes and also not to declare the result if in the opinion of the observer a particular booth has been captured or rigged. Thus this topic becomes important especially with respect to the recent guidelines issued by Election Commission of India 
and also with respect to chief electoral officer, returning officer as well as observers. Now in your prelims examination this topic gets covered under Indian polity and governance and in your mains it gets covered under GS paper 2 especially with respect to salient features of representation of people's act which includes both the representation of people act of 1951 as well as representation of people act of 1950. So with this let's move on to our third news analysis. Now the next news to be discussed appears on page number 8. It says Kerala readies to host its first dragonfly festival. Thambi Mahotsavam will encourage varied participation with Pantalu as its official mascot. So this Pantalu has been selected as the official mascot for Kerala's first dragonfly festival. Now to conduct the Thambi Mahotsavam of 2020, WWF India Kerala unit, Society for Odonate Studies and Thumbi Puranam have joined hands to conduct this Thambi Mahotsavam of 2020. And as already mentioned, the official mascot has been selected as Pantalu. Now the objectives of Society for Odonate Studies is to promote the science of odonatology, which is a study of insect order Odanta. Now there are two insects which are in the Odanta class, namely dragonflies as well as damselfies. It says that even though it's a small class, both these insects play a big role in the food chain. As without the Odanta class, the mosquitoes would burst out of control and even the fish eat Odanta class. So, without Odanta, we would normally run out of some fish we eat. So, in this regard with respect to Odanta, what you need to know is that within the class of Odanta, there are two insects namely damselfies as well as dragonflies and they also play a significant role in the food chain. So, on this note, let us go through some of the important activities with respect to the State Dragonfly Festival which is to take place in Kerala. Now, the activities which is to be undertaken for the celebration of Thumbi Mahotsavam includes Citizen Science Project where a dragonfly backyard watch has been announced to enhance the participation of people and also improve their observation skills. A social media campaign has been launched. A field guide on the common dragonflies of Kerala has been announced. Children's Dragonfly Coloring and Activity Book has been announced. Further setting up of Knowledge Hub on social media platforms such as Facebook has also been announced as it will host all available material in the form of scientific papers, posters, videos and stickers on dragonflies. Now important point is that the events are a part of National Dragonfly Festival which is being organized by WWF India, Bombay Natural History Society as well as the Indian Dragonfly Society and this is done in association with National Biodiversity Board, United Nations Environment Program, United Nations Development Program and International Union for Conservation of Nature. Now this particular question was asked by UPSC in the prelims of 2014 on the Bombay Natural History Society. So the question was with reference to Bombay Natural History Society consider the following statements. First, it is an autonomous organization under the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Second, it strives to conserve nature through action-based research, education and public awareness. And third, it organizes and conducts nature trails and camps for the general public. So in this regard, the question was which of the statements given above is are correct. Now to answer this question, one need to know about the Bombay Natural History Society. It highlights that it is a pan-India wildlife research organization and has been promoting the cause of nature conservation since 1883. And its mission is to conserve nature primarily biological diversity through action based on research, education and public awareness and its vision is premier independent scientific organization with a broad based constituency excelling in the conservation of threatened species and habitats. Now with respect to the website it highlights about conservation research, conservation action and conservation education. So coming back to the answer, the first statement becomes incorrect as it is not an autonomous organization under the Ministry of Environment and Forest whereas the second and third options are correct. So the correct answer here is C, that is 2 and 3 only. Now this topic primarily becomes important for your prelims with respect to environmental ecology as well as biodiversity. So with this, let's move on to our next news of discussion. Next news to be discussed appears on page number 15. It says SPI to raise rupees 8,931 crore via Basel 3 bonds. So this news highlights that the State Bank of India has approved the proposal to raise Rs 8,931 crores by issuing Basel III compliant bonds to investors. It says that the bond is in the nature of debentures qualifying as tier 2 capital of the bank and have a face value of Rs 10 lakh. 
Further, it says that it bears a coupon of 6.8% payable annually for a tenure of 15 years. Now this particular news becomes important because of this particular question asked by UPSC in the prelims of 2015. Now the question asked by UPSC was fairly simple. The question was that Basel 3 Accord or simply Basel 3 often seen in the news seeks to Options were A. Develop national strategies for the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity B. Improve banking sector's ability to deal with financial and economic stress and improve risk management C. Reduce the greenhouse gas emissions but places a heavier burden on developed countries and D. Transfer technology from developed countries to poor countries to enable them to replace the use of chlorofluorocarbons in refrigeration with harmless chemicals. So we see that four different kinds of options were provided in 2015 and here the correct answer was B. That is to improve banking sector's ability to deal with financial and economic stress and improve risk management. So in this regard, you need to know certain basic facts with respect to the Basel 3 Accord. Now first and foremost, you need to know that Basel 3 norms are being implemented in phases since 2013 by the domestic banks to mitigate concerns on potential stress on asset quality and consequential impact on performance and profitability of banks. And overall, the Basel 3 norms aims to strengthen the regulation, supervision and risk management of banks. So basically by adhering to Basel 3 norms, it improves bank sector's ability to deal with financial and economic stress and improve risk management. So as per this news, SBI will issue Basel 3 compliant bonds to investors. And these bonds are in the nature of non-convertible. That is these bonds or debentures cannot be converted back into shares. Taxable, redeemable, subordinated, unsecured and fully paid up debt instruments. So basically, these bonds are in the nature of debentures. It further says that the bonds in the nature of debentures qualifying as tier 2 capital of bank have a face value of rupees 10 lakh and they bear a coupon of 6.8% payable annually for a tenor of 15 years. So whoever buys these Basel 3 approved bonds from SBI, they will get a return at 6.8% annually. Now with respect to tier 1 and tier 2 capital, what you need to know is that tier 1 capital is the primary source of earning of banks and they are banks core capital and disclosed reserves which is shown in the financial accounts of banks and tier 1 capital also includes shareholders equity as well as retained earnings of the bank. Whereas tier 2 capital can be said to be the supplementary capital of the banks and are considered less reliable as compared to tier 1 capital as tier 2 capitals are more difficult to liquidate. For example, undisclosed reserves, hybrid financial products, that is such financial products having aspects of both shares as well as debentures, as well as certain subordinated term debts. So this is the basic difference with respect to tier 1 and tier 2 capital. So here the news says that the bonds issued by SBI is in the nature of debentures qualifying as tier 2 capital. So from your prelims perspective, this is what you need to know with respect to difference between tier 1 and tier 2 capital. As tier 1 capital are bank's core capital and primary source of earnings for the banks, whereas tier 2 capitals are supplementary capital. Now in this regard, SBI has said that the bonds come with a call option after 10 years or any anniversary date thereafter to bond subscribers. So this means that the issuer of the bonds, that is SBI, can call back the bonds before the maturity date that is after 10 years but before 15 years by paying back the principal amount to investors. It further says that under Basel 3 capital regulations banks need to improve and strengthen their capital planning processes. Further with respect to Basel 3 it is an internationally agreed set of measures developed by Basel committee on banking supervision which was constituted in response to the financial crisis of 2007 and 9. And this initiative was taken to strengthen the regulation, supervision and risk management of banks. So from your prelims perspective, you should know that commercial banks issue Basel 3 compliant bonds to investors. Basel 3 is an internationally agreed set of measures developed by Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, which was done in response to the financial crisis of 2007-9. And this measure aims to strengthen the regulation, supervision and risk management of banks. And this was exactly what was being asked by UPSC in the prelims of 2015. So this news must be understood primarily from the prelims perspective 
especially with respect to Basel 3 norms. With this, let's move on to our next news discussion. The next news to be discussed appears on page number 8. It says, third warning as Godavari level rises at Bhadrachalam. About 150 habitations flooded in both Godavari districts. So in this regard, this news highlights that officials of the Central Water Commission have issued the third warning as water level in Godavari has increased to 55.30 feet at Bhadrachalam. Now in this news, you need to understand about Central Water Commission as well as about Godavari River. Now look at this particular question asked by UPSC in the prelims of 2015. The question was, consider the following rivers, Vamandhara, Indravati, Paranhita and Penar. The question was, which of the above are tributaries of Godavari? So in this regard, you need to know about Godavari as it is a very important river of India. So as you can see that Godavari is the largest peninsular river system in the country and it is also called Dakshin Ganga. Further, it rises in Nasik district of Maharashtra and discharges its water into Bay of Bengal. Now this aspect is clearly visible in this particular map which has been represented here. Now the tributaries of Godavari run through states of Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Odisha as well as Andhra Pradesh. Now in this regard you need to know about the left bank tributaries as well as right bank tributaries of Godavari. The left bank tributaries includes Dharna, Pain Ganga, Vain Ganga, Vardha, Paranhita, Pench, Kanha, Sabari as well as Indravati. And right bank tributaries include Pravara, Mula, Manjra, Pedavagu, Maner etc. Further it says that the Godavari is subjected to heavy floods in its lower reaches in the south of Pulavaram where it forms a picturesque gorge. It is navigable only in the deltaic stretch. It further says that the river after Rajamundri splits into several branches forming a large delta before it flows into the Bay of Bengal. So after understanding about Godavari, let's go through these options again. Now here we see that only Indravati and Paranhita are tributaries of Godavari as this is Paranhita and this is Indravati whereas the other rivers are not tributaries of Godavari. So in this the correct answer is D that is 2 and 3 only. So we understand that we need to know about important rivers in India especially with respect to their tributaries and where they flow into. Further, we also need to know about Central Water Commission. Now, the Central Water Commission is a premier technical organization of India in the field of water resources and as of now, it is presently functioning as an attached office of Ministry of Jal Shakti, Department of Water Resources, River Development and Ganga Rejuvenation under Government of India. It further says that the Commission is generally entrusted with general responsibilities of initiating, coordinating and furthering in consultation of state governments concerned schemes for control, conservation and utilization of water resources throughout the country and this is done for the purpose of flood control, irrigation, navigation, drinking water supply as well as water power development. It further says that it also undertakes investigations, construction and execution of any such schemes as is required. Further, the Central Water Commission is headed by a chairman with the status of ex officio secretary to the government of India. And the work of commission is divided into three wings, namely designs and research wing, river management wing and water planning and projects wing. And each wing is placed under the charge of full time member having the status of ex officio additional secretary to the government of India. And it also comprises of number of organizations which is entrusted with various tasks as well as duties. So these are some of the important aspects with respect to Central Water Commission. As it is an attached office under the Ministry of Jal Shakti, under Department of Water Resources, River Development and Ganga Regeneration. Thus this topic becomes important primarily from your prelims perspective, especially with respect to Indian geography as well as general issues on environment. Now after our discussion, this becomes your practice question for the day. The question is, arrange the following rivers from north to south. Options are Mahanadi, Godavari, Kaveri and Krishna. And the options given are A. 2314 B. 1423 C. 1243 and D. 4321 Now coming to the answer of yesterday, the question was which of the following tribes live in Nilgiris? Options were Irula, Kurumba and Munda. In this the first two options are correct whereas third option is incorrect. So the question was select the correct answer using the code given below. So our correct answer here become B that is 1 and 2 only. So with this we come to an end to today's discussion. Thank you.